Hi, Smart Community friends, and welcome to the summer series here on the Smart Community Podcast. As you know, we're taking a little break from new content over the Australian summer holidays, and instead we're sharing the replays of a few of our all-time favourite episodes. This week, we're sharing my interview with Samuel Austin from episode 340, which was published in May of 2023. Sam is an urban planner, community engagement specialist and placemaker, and also the New South Wales Young Planner of the Year for 2022. In this episode, Sam tells us about his background in urban city planning and his interest and passion for the relationship between people and place. We talk about the role data plays in planning and analysis of how people are using spaces, and Sam tells us about his work on the neon grid and nighttime economy strategy for Sydney. Sam and I discuss the importance of breaking down barriers and silos within cities and communities to foster an integrated approach for a seamless experience for the customer, as well as what the nighttime economy and neon grid looks like in semi-urban and regional or rural settings. Sam tells us about community engagement projects he's worked on in Sydney, and we finish our chat discussing the emerging trend of live data allowing for appropriate and timely responses to community requirements. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Sam. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I am fabulous. I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. So let's just jump straight in. And can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? Sure. So my background really is all things urban city planning. Um, I've been working in a mix of government and consulting through my professional career. I currently work for JSC Consulting. And at our firm, we do a real broad mix of strategic planning, public policy and community engagement and uh, the team there is really sort of passionate about people and place. I've also actually been quite fortunate to be awarded the New South Wales Young Planner of the Year. Um, and I've also been nominated for Australian Young Planner of the Year, which is really, really exciting. Um, but I suppose more about my interests. Um, I'm quite involved as an advocate for the industry. Um, I'm a member of the Young Planners and Nighttime Industry Association. And my interest and passion really lies around our urban environments. And to me, it's all about exploring that relationship between people and place. I really want to understand and unpack how we can help grow and manage our cities and towns to really make sure that we're building places that are catering for us, you know, its people, its users. Uh, And that's really reflected in a lot of the place planning and strategy work I've been involved in. Recently, a lot of that has been manifested as a passion for the nighttime economy in our cities. And I've also been really fortunate to be involved in a number of projects that have really helped grow and address some of those barriers that do impact the nighttime in our cities. Uh, and, and that ranges across developing and delivering nighttime strategies across New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, and particularly my involvement at the Nighttime Industry Association, I've been fortunate to help advocate for the nighttime space there too. Oh, that's awesome. Keen to, I guess, dig into that in a bit more detail. But Let's first go to broad and then we'll go deeper. But uh, what is a smart community to you? Yeah, for sure. So to me, smart communities and cities is one of many tools we really have as planners and as urbanists to help truly enable places uh, and make places for people. Smart communities really make sure that all stakeholders get to understand and have informed decisions about the places around us. Particularly as an urban planner, really a key role of ours is to analyse and assess multiple pieces of data and to make decisions about the places that we live in. Um, you know, starting broad and, and looking at a really traditional approach, it's really all about layering different insights and data together. And having a smart community really is what enables that uh, broader analysis and investigation. Um, working and planning, particularly we're starting off with very traditional data sets. Often it's around demographics and socioeconomic data. We start analysing land use and build environments uh, and then investigating the various transport networks and natural environment and biodiversity. 
particularly in place planning too and a lot of work we've been involved in. A lot of that involves doing lots of physical audits of spaces, um, you know, looking at what uses and activity are occurring in a space, you know, is a place comfortable and what, what is the image and sense of feeling you get in a place, uh, what's that kind of access and movement, uh, and is that space social as well? And really that get, lets us make, uh, allows us to explore, you know, the identity of a space, um, you know, whether it's walkable, whether people can access it, whether people feel safe, and, and that public domain aspect of it too. So to me, a smart community means just having a more uh, and allowing us more data, uh, additional data points to access and layer onto that analysis and insights approach. And it really excites me because it's continuing to evolve on this traditional approach that we've always sort of taken and, and really, really make sure that we are creating good and enjoyable places for people across our cities. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I do, I think it's a really important point that that as planners or you know, I'm an engineer, I know, <laughs> I hang out with a lot of planners, okay. Um, but in all of these things that we, we do that, you know, building this um, community infrastructure, places, et cetera, roads, buildings, et cetera, et cetera. We have these traditional foundations, right? And there's data in that. There's, you know, things that we've b- brought in. There's technology, there's tools, and they just continue to build and grow and evolve. But I think what this smart community aspect does is helps us to look at what tools are available and just over the future, you know, just beyond the horizon and then very much on the horizon, you know, way, way in the way in the distance. And then what can we do to bring those in that may not be so traditional um, as such, but then building on that, I think is really important. It's not some like new thing over here. It's actually building on what we already have making incremental change in most cases, but actually then sometimes fundamental change in other cases. So there's like this kind of balance between this radical, there's radical shifts and then there's incremental changes and those two together then, you know, kind of form this um, this improved quality of life for people, better places, all these things that we want that I think, yeah, and there's so many different aspects of it as well. But as a planner, there are so many different aspects of communities, cities. So it's just like building on that as well. And I also think I talk to a lot of people on the podcast too, bringing in different skill sets. Like, you know, traditionally Smart Cities was very much technology. So, you know, you have your tech people talking about what they can do for cities, but the planners weren't necessarily involved in that conversation and vice versa. Maybe the planners were going away and planning, but the tech conversation wasn't, in, you know, or the data conversation wasn't kind of connected so it's yeah I think that's um, a really key point there is building on those foundations but then all those other different things that are coming in well just just on that data topic too I think yeah it is really fantastic where we are in planning at the moment because we are now actually getting access to all these really really interesting data sources and allowing us to uncover insights that we just wouldn't otherwise be able to understand or otherwise identify previously so you know, it, it really broad, you know, really, really broadly ranges around using algorithms and open data to pull out business data and points of interest and allowing us to really sort of spatially map a lot of this movement across cities. Um, I think that's particularly interesting, you know, here in New South Wales, we do have access to open card data usage, which is how people tap on and tap off to access our transport network. And that really lets us look at peaks and troughs and how people are moving, and then particularly in a post-COVID world, of how that movement is changing. Outside of that, um, particularly outside of New South Wales, you also have access to things like micro-mobility data from e-scooters and e-bikes, which is also a really other, a fascinating layer to be able to layer into your land use decisions and analysis too. So to really see how people are moving around a space. Yeah, I think that's really important to mention. Obviously, transport is a huge part of our communities. But just that extra layer of data that we now have available that we can, you know, bring in and analyze. Before it was kind of invisible, those movements could have been invisible, or they were, you know, assumptions or, or whatever the case is. What are some of the other kind of data sources? Like, you know, we've talked about those traditional ones. What data sources are you might most excited about that are either, you know, kind of here and you've seen them come in, or like the future ones that you're hoping to get your hands on? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, um, so look, I'll relate this back to a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment, and that's really around the nighttime economy. Um, the nighttime economy is quite a broad discussion, and I think it's worth noting that it's more than just, you know, bars and pubs. It, it actually really is sort of a question about equity in the city. 
Um, I'm going to use Sydney as my sort of home case study here, but I know these challenges aren't unique to Sydney, and, and I'm, hopefully this resonates with the global audience of your podcast too. Really, for the nighttime economy, we're looking at things like you know, late night supermarkets, gyms, and we're, and we're looking at how we can meet the needs of a growing sector of employees, particularly here in Sydney. Uh, two of those big areas that are increasing are around logistics and healthcare workers. When we look at that, that's uh, a lot of that has to do around the new airport that's getting built out in Western Sydney and exploring around how that this 24-hour airport, which is what we don't currently have in Sydney, the current airport only operates, um, you know, it, it stops from 11 to 6 a.m. and understanding what that means for the local industries that are going to set up there. So at the moment, there's a forecast of around 200,000 additional jobs to be created by the new airport um, with a big focus on freight, uh, agribusiness and the visitor economy. So when we're looking at those new jobs, we're looking at, you know, how people are going to respond to that space and how we can plan for people in that space and planning for making sure that people who work in the evening do have the same access to services and products and everything else that everyone else does during the daytime and and really breaking out of that traditional nine to five space. In terms of planning for the nighttime economy and new data sets and new bits of you know, smart communities and things that we can explore. Really, it's all about building on that traditional base I I mentioned before. So building on that sort of demographic and employment analysis, looking at how businesses um, are, you know, pulling using algorithms and AI to sort of pull out business data, understand the opening hours of those businesses, where they're located, and looking at the peaks and troughs uh, in terms of when people are accessing those businesses and also understanding when they're closing and having a broader discussion and investigation around what are the transport networks doing at that time. So at nine o'clock, if all your businesses are closing off, what does that mean for the transport network? And having access to things like the Opal data or also live data and live people movement means that we really, really start getting deep analysis and really good insights around how people are moving around a space in a center. Um, Particularly, I think, that's really interesting for looking at an individual center, but the value of smart communities comes that when we traditionally always done that analysis on, say, the one center and had an investigation of, you know, one, one town within a city, the value of smart communities is then taking that entire process and being able to replicate it seamlessly across multiple centers across a city using a very similar amount of resources. So rather than spending years and years doing these individual studies and research on different centers, we have now the access to and programs and, and AI and, and other bits of data that really allows us to do this analysis across a whole area quite quickly. And we really get a good picture about what's happening in this suburb and how you compare to this place. And okay, well, what these people are, you know, this center is quite successful. The place we're looking at maybe has a few issues. How can we look at replicating those or what are the solutions that those, that other centers use that we can look to apply to our own one too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really a key point as well. It's that scalability then allows us to have greater impact because we can, you know, we're using less time, money and resources to do more than we could do before. And I think the more we appreciate that, then the more we can, well, we can just continue to scale, I suppose. So it's not just oh, well, we did this one thing, it was bespoke and whatever, and it was really great. We got some great insights. But then to be able to, and not necessarily compare, it's not apples with apples, but it's like, yeah, like you said, this thing is working here. These the, these features are the same. This one's a bit different. What, what are the things that we could do across to, to, you know, to lift all the, you know, rising tide lifts all boats kind of situation. And I think... Yeah, that scale, we have to think about that scalability, which I think is probably from um, like a traditional sense is probably a little bit, that's a bit of a shift, you know, a bit of a shift in thinking because, you know, you typically focus just on one place, but now we're thinking, well, yeah, you're scaling that, that out much further and it's not just, you know, the geographical area as well, like we're scaling on a digital sense as well. So it's, I think, yeah, it's really interesting. I think nighttime economy is also a fascinating one because it's something that we all experience. It all go, but some often we don't often think about how much our movements, activities, the things that we access change at nighttime. Absolutely. 
And I think that really speaks to um, that relationship between people and place too, the way that, you know, people do access a space, but looking at the broader, if we're scaling up and looking at multiple places at once, we're looking at that relationship about how people are moving to into this space from another place. So it's really taking that place-based approach and understanding the broader context of why people are coming to a space, what people associate with that space, the identity of a place as well. And that really scalability is really, really the enabler of that investigation. Mm. Yeah, and we often think about, um, we talk about scalability from in terms of like kind of if we're scaling a sensor network or whatever, we can scale it across multiple areas. But yeah, it's also scaling the concepts and tools and, you know, that analysis, actually, the analysis across different places, which is a bit of a different, like a bit of a shift in thinking, right? Mm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, no, that's really fascinating. And I think from a nighttime economy perspective, I've been doing a bit of work around um, safety and things like that. And when I did my Churchill Fellowship, I, like, I travelled around, I was by myself, and I, yeah, I did get a, a bit naive when I first, I'd done a lot, a lot of travel. But then when I first kind of, you know, I was like, oh, yep, that's right, here I am. And then I went, oh, I am a woman traveling alone in a country that I don't know. And no one knows that I, where I am, who I, you know, no one, whatever. And I was just like, oh, that's right. I have to think about this. And I had like a bit of an incident with a Lyft driver where I went, oh, I'm in a very vulnerable position. I need to, one, stop sharing so much data about myself and what I'm doing. And two, that and this was during the day, but then, yeah, at night time, completely, you know, the whole, like, you know, I might walk down the street during the day and not even think about it. But then at night, I'm on high alert because, you know, things have shifted. And same physical space, but just that difference is, is really fascinating. And the things that we can do to improve the quality of life, well, people's quality of life, I suppose, at, at night time. Me as a visitor, fine, yep, that's great. But actually um, what you were talking about earlier is people who are like shift workers or whatever, they're having, uh, being able to have the same quality or, you know, equal quality of life, to be able to access services, things, and all those type of things at nighttime. It's not just about, oh, well, we want to go out and go to the pub or whatever. It's actually, no, this is when people have time to be able to do these things. So how do you ensure that they can? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. It, it also filters across so many different aspects of yeah, our lives. Yeah, well, just to jump back from that safety aspect too, firstly, sorry to hear about your experience. Um, yeah, survived. I, <laughs> I think a, a lot of the interest there around places and the way we explore places too is that smart uh, technology within spaces and embedded smart tech really allows us to analyse the long-term trends of the improvements and changes we make. Um, a lot of the recommendations and work we do around smart, the nighttime economy quite often involves tactical urbanism or looking at placemaking and looking at how we can activate spaces and streets. And if we can explore the way that people are moving across a different space, particularly between the day and the night, we get a really good understanding of where the pinch points are, where the pain points are. You know, when someone leaves this activation, um, how has that changed the way they access, say, the car park? And what is the route they take to get to the car park to drive home? Why do they take this route instead of another? Um, how come this component of the street makes people feel unsafe versus another area where there's obviously lighting or people walking around where people feel safer to move across? Why does that attract people versus what can be done in these spaces where we're experiencing these challenges or issues around safety and, and that perception of safety too? Mm, and I was going to say, yeah, perception of safety is also a really key one. For example, like during the day and night, I may have had the same risk of safe, you know, the same level of risk or whatever, but that perception is, yeah, was completely different. For example, walking down that same street um, during the day and night, but it's, we call it, you know, perception or perceived or whatever, but it's a real risk to me or so that I will change my behaviour. So like the impact is real, even if it's a perceived, you know, safety risk or whatever. The impact is real because then I might choose to not go down that street. So, you know, which then reduces, you know, if I live there or whatever, reduces my um, ability to uh, take a job at night time, for example, or, you know, spend my money in the local economy at night time and those type of things, or even, you know, that social aspect of, you know, not going out you know, if you're a single person or whatever the case is. And I think um, that's really, really, and it's a huge, I guess, focused area like now and we're thinking about it a lot more. 
and there's so many things that uh, feed into it and kind of play off each other as well. Like you were touching on like the the lighting and those type of things. We talk about those and even the presence of CCTV and things like that, but it's not necessarily what is the only reason why people feel safe or, you know, it's different for different people as well. But what are those urban form aspects of the design that also feed into that? And from a smart cities perspective, a smart community perspective, it's, it's not just like, oh, cool, well, let's, what tech can we install here to make people feel safe or whatever? It's no, it needs to be integrated in a holistic approach of a combination of, you know, urban form with maybe some beautiful installations as well as, you know, some device charging because then people can dwell and then there's people around activation, all those type of things. And so that's where I'm really excited that the maturity of the space has increased so much because we are having those conversations now. Mm. And just with those multiple data points too, I think that's really, really helpful in terms of making sure to take it up from uh, the, the next step from safety, I suppose, having that data insights to understand how people respond to activations in an area or activated spaces and, and popular venues. And um, because we have so many data points, it's looking at how and this is probably a bit more uh, consumer or customer facing, um, the way we sort of integrate bits of data around, uh, say, the transport network. If you're in a bar, for example, um, having some form of signage or device that says, hey, you know, the next train's coming in an hour, we're shutting in an hour, this is how you can get there kind of thing. It's looking beyond, I suppose, that traditional approach and how we can use all these different pieces of sensors and data that we're collecting incidentally because everyone has a mobile phone, there's sensors all over the place, they're collecting this data, why don't we start using it to actually make better places for people and allow us to really move across our cities in a much more ease, improve our ease across cities and, and that equity component too. Mm, yeah, it's, actually, it's breaking down those silos or barriers between, for the community, they are, this won't come out right, but they're invisible we know like if we're working in the uh, government or, or, you know, we're a consultant or we're a private business, we know that, you know, there's these separations, but the uh, kind of, you know, borders around each of these things. For the community, they might not see them, but they feel them, right? They're in a bar that doesn't connect to exactly like you just said. If I knew then the train leaves an hour, the bar closes an hour, great, I'll, I'll have another beverage and then I'll, I'll jump on the train to make sure I don't miss it because I don't, you know, then that saves me money, I get taxi, whatever the case is, it's safer if I'm blah, 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 whatever, or I can, yeah, then maybe there's a couple of people that are going to go, so then we go together or whatever. You know, just a very kind of simple example, but just like breaking down those barriers so then we're, we feel like it's actually just one city. It's not, oh, that's a bar, that's a train, that's a whatever. Because even we think about from a council state perspective as well, we want to start breaking down those barriers as well. Obviously, there's some very clear things that each one does but what is that kind of what does that look like when you're not going oh well I have to talk to that council about that and this year it's actually that integrated approach which you know we're all moving um, in that way to have that kind of seamless experience and you know certain services will also obviously only fit in certain things but it's that seamless experience of having the customer right at the the center and so it's not like the customer has to make all these decisions about, you know, who who I need to talk to. That's made very easy and seamless. You just need to know what you want and then you can, you know, you're served by the rest of the, the community or the city or, um, you know, the place that you live. Mm. Just to add on that too, um, I really like that concept of the one city idea, particularly around the night time. Um, there's this sort of concept that's used quite heavily by the New South Wales government around the neon grid concepts. Um, it's this exploration about how different centres relate to each other and particularly how they turn on and off during the night and the way that people uh, get from point A to point B and the relationship of those different centres to each other too. I think it's really, really interesting the way that smart communities are enabling that neon grid to really expand, um, particularly in a post-COVID world where people are looking more locally, people are working from home and they're trying to go to their local centres rather than always commuting out to the CBD. Um, that really sort of allows us to explore what are the transport options and decisions around different spaces and different centres and really allows us to do detailed insights around safety decisions and even more around resourcing in terms of council staff or council operations around general maintenance, you know, regular 
increasing the frequency we pick up bins or street cleaning, et cetera, in spaces and having an access to all this additional data and being able to layer on more and more data insights to that approach really means we can keep continuing to plan for our spaces in a more holistic approach. Mm, yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's it's data that may seem very mundane, you know, on its own or just generally, but layering that then to make those better decisions can really unlock some, you know, some really key insights. And also, we, you know, when we talk about data, obviously privacy and security are these, you know, huge, very massive considerations and, you know, we're talking about data breaches and things like that. But the, the what you can glean from data that has no personal information as well, when we're talking about cities and operations, is also really fascinating and something we don't talk about enough. We often get focused, which is obviously a very important topic as well, but you know, thinking about like bin pickups and things like that, which is what I think about all day, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, how many people, not necessarily the, like I don't need to know that that you or I are at the train station, but how many people are and where they're coming from and too. There's those types of things that I think we can really, we haven't leveraged that enough yet to be able to then, you know, keep shifting and changing and asking those questions. But yeah, there's still so much opportunity to really lift that uh, element of, you know, city operations and things like that, going back to that, I guess, one city approach. Now, we are going to go to the future very soon, but just want to, I know I actually haven't asked, and you've shared some amazing things in the projects and things that you've been working on. Is there any other projects you want to mention before we zoom to the future? Yeah, absolutely. On the theme of the nighttime, um, we did recently, and I think I just touched on it earlier, uh, recently assisted a local government in Queensland uh, developing their uh, local nighttime economy strategy. And I think that really picks up on a lot of themes and things we've been talking about here. Um, so particularly for this area, they are a uh, well, sort of semi-urban, semi-rural council. Um, they have a huge, huge area. And it was this really broad investigation around the different centres and how they relate to each other. So really touching on that neon grid concept around Okay, well, so this centre here has a cluster of restaurants, but uh, a lot of the entertainment venues are, say, uh, you know, 10 to 15 kilometres away. What are the planning interventions we need to explore for this certain space? And then how can we look at the different transport options to make sure that people are able to easily get from point A to point B? I think particularly as well for looking at a, uh, you know, the accounts of that context between a mix between urban and regional, there's some really interesting questions outside of, I suppose, the traditional nighttime approach. So traditionally, people think of nighttime, they're thinking of inner city experiences, they're talking about bars. I, I mean, when you mentioned nighttime, the first thing that comes to mind is, yeah, walking down a street in the city, really. So you get this really, really interesting local context. And I think that allows us to build on the strengths of looking at a, and taking a place-based uh, approach to planning for our spaces and understanding that and, and making sure that we are making a uh, space that's the community are really interested in and we do have a reflection of the community within those businesses and within the urban environment. And I think particularly for that project, um, we helped a lot champ champion a lot of pilot projects and activation up there too. So really allowing and unlocking a lot of that nighttime opportunity within each individual centre and understanding that relationship between, you know, centre A and centre B. Mm, yeah, no, really um, fascinating work. And I think one of the points you touched on there is around not just thinking about, yeah, that kind of CBD or city, but what does that mean for more regional, rural places and, yeah, that kind of those local local centres and, and streets and, and just thinking about, like, you know, the entertainment's here, the restaurant's here, how are we going to connect that together? Or does, you know, do we need to rezone over here so then we've got, you know, what do people need when they're doing this, that and the other? But then also, yeah, from a like a, I guess a general city, uh, sorry, a general like community life perspective, what are some of those things that then we can start integrating into the planning as well? Mm. And just to relate it back to smart communities as well, I think it's really important to highlight that a study of that size really wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have the opportunity to do uh, that scalability of analysis, if we didn't have the ability to quickly pull out and analyse multiple different data points and do lots of different analysis on particularly on say footpath foot traffic patterns on where people are moving to even having access to uh yeah e-scooter and e-bike movements 
and understanding, okay, well, people are using it to get from point A to point B. What is the reason they're choosing to use this rather than taking, say, public transport or, you know, choosing to drive, et cetera. So, yeah, scalability really is the key opportunity there for, for that analysis. Mm, I guess, um, like, uh, from a planner perspective, you know, you would have done a planning degree, maybe you've done another study, et cetera. For the future, like, you know, if you're a planner or whatever, what are some of those other skill sets that you think really enhance, will, will enhance, well, one that may enhance but actually be necessary, like, completely in the future? Like, we think, obviously, we're talking a lot about data. Do you think that that's, you know, just going to, obviously, some form of analysis obviously fits already in that, but that traditional layer. What are some of those other, I guess, skill sets that you're seeing kind of come through or, or do you think are really important for the future? Yeah. I think a lot of the leading planners in this space uh, really have either a technology background or have a good understanding of, of programming and be able to write their own programs uh, to do this analysis. I think that's really critical for people moving into the space and in the future. And I think, look, me personally, because I do have a bit of an understanding around that and a bit of a background, I've actually been really fortunate to help develop some sort of smart city tools that we do use here at JOC. And I think that's really, really uh, critical in people moving into the industry. That data set, yeah, can't be understated. Uh, sorry, that skill set can't be understated enough. Mm, no, um, that, that's really interesting because I think, um, I mean, even as an engineer, you know, I did a master's of data science because I wanted to kind of, you know, bring that uh, level in. Obviously, I did a certain amount of, you know, math and data stuff at uni, but it just, it wasn't, it's not, it, for me, it wasn't, it's not focused on, uh, I guess that city holistic, you know, that type of thing. And I think we'll get more of that moving forward. And also just um, communication and engagement. I laugh because as engineers, we have this, you know, kind of reputation as not being good at that, which I think is unfair, sometimes fair, but I think moving forward, we'll, we appreciate that a lot more because we have like this. The other thing I see in smart communities is that radical shift that needs to happen in engagement, co-design, whatever you want to call it, because their data, po- their data points as well. And obviously we would never say to the community, you're a data point, but we also want not even data points, they're stories, right? They're real, real. We need those as well because obviously we can look at the numbers, but we need the stories and a couple of aspects. You need the stories because that enriches our data sets to, you know, context and, and you know, just, you know, the little magic in there. But then we don't want to be doing things to the community. We want to be doing things with the community, with the skill sets and the tools and things that we have available and really pulling out that insight and then making good decisions about that as well. I think, yeah, I think that's a really, really critical component too around the community engagement aspect and and small communities have so much to offer in that space. Uh, A recent project we undertook was around looking and exploring a local character and, you know, because a lot of us team are quite skilled in design um, and having access to, say, 3D printers and things in Sydney, we were able to really quickly mock up and design a representative buildings and built environment of a certain space and then take that to the community. And while that sounds a bit sort of simplistic and, you know, looking at these little uh, models and things, what that means is people can quickly identify and quickly respond to what you're putting in front of them. And it helps break down a lot of that complicated jargon we have around particularly planning and helps people uh, quickly express how they feel about a space and allows you to really understand what they associate with character and what that place identity is. So I think having all these tools available to us um, around community engagement, and that's, you know, quite a traditional one because we're talking about in-person engagement, of course, there's a whole plethora of online engagement that's occurring too, which means that we are getting a much better penetration, you know, feedback and results from the community. But it really, really enables us to get those detailed insights about people's understanding of place and their understanding of the character of a space too. Mm, absolutely. I think we overestimate our, our ability as, you know, kind of professionals in the space, but also the community's ability, so everyone's ability to imagine something 3D by looking at a 2D drawing. And... And again, it's that speed and scale, being able to quickly mock up something that, you know, without, with limited resources, you know, with reduced resources, not reduced, but, you know, not as many resources, like you don't have to send it away and, you know, whatever, if you can print it out, 
And again, it's, you know, a physical thing because we you need to speak the language of the community. Community. Some people will be able to maybe put on 3D, you know, glasses and be able to, you know, look at an augmented sense, but you want, you need to have different channels. And I, and I think making those easier and, and then identifying what works for different people and having those options available. And we're able to because we've been able to reduce the barriers to have access to these you know, tools and, and uh, tools of the trade, essentially. Our tools of the trade are changing. And so we need to be able to grasp that. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it really means that we can rapidly respond to people. That example I just gave, we had two workshops. Um, and the first workshop, we had a lot of people expressing their thoughts and feelings around character. And then a week later, we were able to turn around, you know, these little 3D designs and come up with a completely different approach to that second workshop. Um uh, all based on the feedback we received. Uh, and that really wouldn't be achievable unless we had access to smart tools and, and able to get things printed out in, you know, a day or two. Really, really quick turnarounds and a lot of this stuff. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, okay, let's go to the future now. Uh, what are the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? I think there's a lot of trends out there. Um, I'm obviously relating it back to data, and that's been the big discussion point today. I think there's, uh, and I was talking about the neon grid earlier too, I think really critically the access and ability to analyse live data is going to be a really crucial point in the way we explore and understand our spaces. So looking at that neon grid concept and the understanding the way that, you know, say a night, I'm talking about Sydney here, you know, a night in Castle Hill is very different to a night in Parramatta and the way that people move around our space in real time really gives us and allows us to do a lot more planning on the operational side and also the long-term analysis too and really starts to paint that full term full picture of our cities at night it really lets us start responding with appropriate transport options and looking at safety measures and it really lets us predict peaks and flows and, and the requirements of staff in the future so to me i think live data really is going to be that game changer and really is going to define uh, the future uh, way we analyze spaces too. Mm, yeah. And I think touching on what we were talking about earlier, the skill sets, so then people can know what to ask for and like what, what is available or maybe it's not available yet, but you know, oh, we knew we could get it. We could get that type of data this way. I wonder if we can get that, you know, other type of data in a, another fashion or whatever. And just continuing to question, I think is really important. I know when I was like a, a young grad, I found questioning you're a bit of a troublemaker, whereas I think we need to bust that. That And, you know, the questioning is about, oh, we want to make this better. We want to improve this, you know, it should be encouraged. And, and, and like real questions, like, why do we do it like this? And if there's not a good answer, then how are we going to shift and change it? And you know, that sounds very easy to do. It's not, we as we know, but it doesn't mean that the question shouldn't be asked. And then again, we're talking about those small incremental changes and then those radical shifts. We're going to have both um, as we move forward into the future as well. Yeah, look, I completely agree. And uh, as a young planner in the space, I, I definitely have my thoughts and opinions on how we can uh, challenge the current planning system <laughs> and really make sure we are actually creating spaces for people that are embedding our places with community values too. Mm, mm. Well, Sam, it's been so great to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. I really enjoyed this conversation and it, yeah, it can't be the last one. We'll definitely chat again. But one last question, how can people connect with you? Yep. Best way to connect with me would be through LinkedIn. Samuel Austin's my name. <laughs> That's probably the best way to find me. <laughs> No worries. We'll put all the links in the show notes so people can click away and find you. Again, thank you for coming onto the podcast and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Bye. The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're looking for support in podcast strategy and production, workshop design and facilitation, or communication and media advisory, Get in touch. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community. 
community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.